Welcome to The Metabolic Link, a medical and science-focused podcast that explores the common thread of metabolism in health and disease. This is where science meets society. Welcome to another episode of The Metabolic Link. I'm your host, Victoria Field, and I am so excited to be here today because we've got such a special episode for you. We're releasing a full presentation for Metabolic Health Summit 2024 that was held in Clearwater Beach, Florida. And we don't normally do this kind of thing. So let us know what you think about it. Um, Share with your friends, write us a comment, leave a review, provide us with feedback, because this is something that's very new to us in terms of releasing a full presentation to the public. And I'm excited to share that this presentation happens to be by just an amazing thought leader in our field, Dr. Andy Galpin. Before we dig into this presentation though, I just wanna take a second to say thank you You know, when we started this podcast in 2023, we really weren't sure what to expect. Since then, it's received hundreds of thousands of downloads on your favorite podcast players and views on YouTube. And honestly, we are so incredibly grateful to know that it's resonating with people because it means that people are seeking the latest science on metabolic health and metabolic-based therapy. And to be honest, we feel metabolic therapy is the future of medicine. So the more we can spread the word, the better. So From the bottom of our hearts, thank you so much for watching The Metabolic Link, whether you're watching on YouTube or whether you're listening on your favorite podcast player, we so appreciate you. And here at Metabolic Health Initiative, you know, we've always made it our mission to share free educational content online in particular. Uh, If you've seen our social media channels at Metabolic Health Summit, you've read our reviews of the research, you've watched videos. And this podcast is really an example of those efforts. That said, in order to continue to be able to offer free episodes on this podcast, we also have a private version, I might add, um, that's inside our medical education platform, the Metabolic Initiative. But in order to continue to offer free episodes to the public like this one, um, I'm very excited to share that we're partnering with a few select brands in our field, companies that we know, trust, We've used their products before. This is really a step in an exciting direction because it allows for us to continue doing what we're doing. And I'm I'm very excited to be sharing these brands with you in the coming uh, weeks. You'll be hearing some ads on our podcast. So just know that, you know, we're a science focused organization through and through and science remains at the forefront of everything we do. And so we take this very seriously and we carefully vet the people that we work with. Um, But in advance, I just want to say thank you for supporting the brands that support us so we can keep bringing you episodes of The Metabolic Link. And as I mentioned, this episode is actually from MHS 2024 and was sponsored by our friends at Genova Diagnostics. I want to give you a little bit more information about Genova today because they're just such an amazing team that we feel very grateful to be working with. Genova Connect, powered by Genova Diagnostics, uh, offers easy accessible at-home testing, really, advanced lab tests that you can take in the comfort of your own home. And these tests cover a wide variety of key health areas like metabolic health, gut microbiome, nutrition, uh, hormone health, immune function. I mean, it's really a, a wide variety of options that they offer. I've actually personally used their GI effects test to dig into my gut microbiome and their metabolomics plus test. We actually did a webinar with them, myself and my co-host, Dr. Dominic Degasino. You can certainly check that out. We'll be sure to link that in the show description as well. But I've always been so blown away by the results that they provide because it's not just you're getting your test results and it's sort of this black and white piece of paper. I mean, it is, you know, black and white. Well, actually it does have some colors on it. I will say (laughs) their tests are quite colorful, but um, they provide you with actionable items, you know, things that you can do to improve your health at the same time, which, which I love, you know, so they're really making lab testing and, and gaining insights into your health accessible to everyone. So if you want to find ways to improve your well-being, I highly suggest checking them out online. You can learn more at gdx.net backslash the metabolic link. That's gdx.net backslash the metabolic link. And I will be sure to include this link in the description as well so you can check them out. So special thanks to Genova. I hope you enjoyed this presentation. 
This is by Dr. Andy Galpin entitled Biomolecular Athlete Advanced Tools for Enhancing Human Performance. I hope you enjoy. Dr. Andy Galpin, I've been super excited. I'm so glad we were able to bring him here today. Uh, I've been a huge fan of his work, his podcast on Huberman. If you follow him, you know his work. Uh, so he will be talking about uh, the biomolecular athlete, advanced tools for enhanced human performance. It's going to be a very in-depth uh, conversation. This is hosted by uh, Genova Diagnostics. We are a big fan of Genova and uh, Dr. Galpin is a tenured full professor at California State University, Fullerton, where he serves as a co-director of the Center for Sports Performance. He founded and directs the Biochemistry and Molecular Exercise Physiology Laboratory, holds a PhD in human bioenergetics. He's got over 100 peer-reviewed publications. Dr. Galpin is a leading human performance scientist who has worked with many elite athletes across uh, a broad range of uh, disciplines, uh, UFC, uh, Major League Baseball, NBA, PGA, NFL, uh, he's done it all, uh, Olympics, boxing, and more. He brings a wealth of expertise by applying scientific principles to enhance athletic achievements. Uh, really excited to hear your talk. Let's give a uh, hand for him to take the stage. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Is uh, Mike going here? Can you all hear me? Fantastic. Uh, first of all, before we even get going with the fun stuff, I want to make it clear if, if you're unfamiliar with my work at all, I don't do anything relating to medicine or medical care or pathologies or anything like that. There's a bunch of other ex experts here, some that just got off stage. So if you're coming to me for advice to handle your disease, I can't help you. If you want to do some other stuff, though, I can. And so that's what we're going to get into today. Um, first, before we get going, like any good scientist do, I need to declare my conflicts of interest, of which I have many, and I will violate them. I'm not up here to, to sell you guys on anything, but I'm going to talk about some of the stuff involved in some of these companies. So you've been warned. You signed the waiver. I'm doing it. Um, thank you, Dom, for the intro, but that's, this is what I do. I run the Center for Sport Performance, and, and that's why I want to reiterate what I said a second ago in the fact that I don't do anything on that disease side of the equation, this is enhancing performance. It doesn't necessarily mean just sports. I mean performance. And I'll explain to you what I mean by that in a second. You can define it your own way, but this is my talk, so I get to define it. That's how I roll. In addition, not only have we worked in our laboratory, but uh, we work directly with these folks. Um, this is not kind of one-off consults. This is, is direct implementation of programs over long periods of time for some of the world's highest performers in sports. More recently, we've expanded this to non-professional athletes, but that's been the bulk of our, of our work over the years. So what you're gonna see today is exactly that. It is a combination of things that have been taken from the scientific literature and applied into humans, and does that work in those who are trying to perform at their absolute best? And that, that's really what we do. Before we go any further, I wanna reiterate that Genova paid me to be here. I actually, in my hotel room, I have duffel bags full of cash which is great. I can't even get them all back home. I don't know how I'm going to do it. Um, but, but no, seriously, they, they paid for my speaker fee to be here. Uh, I have a relationship with Genova. I order and have ordered hundreds of their kits over the years, but I pay for it. I don't have any involvement with the business whatsoever. Um, so the only relationship I have to them financially is, is they paid my speaking fee to be here. So are we all clear on that now? Can we do the fun stuff now? All right. Actually, I think they have a booth right outside. You should go check them out. Again, we've ordered hundreds of their kits. That's enough of a plug. You're done. That's all you get. Okay, so what I really want to get into this concept that we call the biomolecular athlete and advanced human performance tools. I'm going to also grant you a couple of more caveats before we get going. Some of the things I'm going to talk about today, you're not going to have access to. I don't feel bad. Some of it you will, but some of it you won't, right? This is really meant to say, okay, what is happening in these high levels of performance? And then what are the things that are coming down the road? I will do my best to translate this in, for some of you in the room that are scientists and some of you that are practitioners and some of you that are just interested in metabolic health. That's all good and great. But it's really not meant to be what is the lowest common denominator. This is what happens at the top 1%, right? Um, and then that's what I'm going to get into because that's what we do. Now, as I said at the beginning, we are fortunate to work with athletes across many sports. We have many of the highest profile ones with the biggest contracts in, in multiple sports, and we're very successful there. But as I said a second ago, to me, performance is not just about sports. 
If you want to take those skills and apply it to hitting a golf ball better or shooting a basketball better, that's fine. But if you want to apply it to any other aspect of your life, I don't care because it's the same physiology. If you want to perform physically and cognitively at your absolute highest and you want to translate that into running a better business, being a better partner, being a better parent, I don't care. Up to you. It's just physiology. Nobody gets away with the low VO2 max. Nobody gets away with low muscle mass. Nobody gets away with poor sugar regulation. It doesn't happen. So that's, it's the same thing all the way up to the very end, which is then what you do on Saturday morning with that skills and talents, right? Good example of that. This is one of the individuals um, that I work with, Travis Barker, a drummer. And that's actually me on stage in front of like 65,000 people. That's my phone. I'm humble bragging here. You can clap now. Wow. And he's so cool. I wish I was him. That's what I'm looking for. Can I have some validation, please? I have been on Huberman seven times, just so you know. Um, but that's him actually a couple weeks after that. And when I, why I bring this up is, again, to brag, mostly, but, and like trying to twist it into a real point. But the, the, the point I'm really getting at is Travis is almost 50 years old. He's got to be able to perform on stage in a very cognitively uh, and neurologically difficult task of drumming perfectly for an hour and a half, right? He's got to do that in front of lights on a certain day at a certain time with crowd, with dehydration. He's also got to do this while he's off of tour, has a new baby, he's not sleeping. And then a couple of weeks later, he was like, yo, I want to do the half marathon. I'm like, what? <laughs> all right. How much time do we have? He's like, it was like 14 days. No, it was like 17 days. I was like, all right, we'll do it. And he smashed it, right? And then he turned on and texted me. He's like, yeah, we're going to do the, the, the full LA marathon. I'm like, tremendous. It's a lot. He's a parent. He's in his 50, almost in his 50s. Like, he has all these other challenges. And so whether you want to actually perform on stage like him or your performance is just like, yo, I want to run a half marathon, it's the same tools and it's the same approach. And that's really all we're going to get into. So in the next 70 minutes or so, I would like to share with you my secret recipe for getting all this stuff done. And if any of you looked at the program and thought, wow, he has a 90-minute talk and thought to yourself like I did, shit, that's a long time. Apparently, you haven't heard any of my podcasts. We will fill this time, friends. I promise you. <laughs> so we got about 70 minutes. We're not even through the intro. That's great. But that's, that's what we're going to do. Okay, so I'd like to start off with this. Um, what I want to show you first is actually what we call our daily schedule. So this is the exact schedule that we put uh, all of our folks on. This is how we set up their day. And pretty much nobody deviates from this. This is we call the perfect athlete daily schedule. And when I say that, I mean Travis, anybody else, every single athlete we work with is on this exact schedule for the most part. So we always have people wake up at 7 a.m., and I could go over the science on this, but this is exactly when you need to wake up, no question about it. And we need to start with hydration, Galpin equation, in case you don't aware. Hydration is important, so we always do two glasses of water in the morning. And then you need to get your body moving, so we start off with the five-minute flow. After that, gratitude journaling, and again, we could cover the science later, is incredibly important. So by 7.10, we need to have our gratitude journaling done. Because then we need to report my HRV and our mood, and I need to have those data every single day. At that point, you can pee. You can't before, because if you do that before your HRV, it throws it off. Also, your mood is different pre, post, pee. So I need those data before you actually do that. At that point, breathing is really important, so we want to set that up uh, and get going on there. By 7.30, you can have breakfast, and it's very important to eat exactly 30 minutes after you wake up. Not 31, not 29. We have to have that meal in there. 7.45, you can say hi to your wife and kids. Not before, because that will definitely fuck up your HRV. I promise. <laughs> Do I need to keep going? <laughs> Are you getting the point here a little bit, right? Hydration, Galpin equation. All right. At that point, we're an hour into our day. Uh, you're going to find out you've been benched, fired, cut. Your company's going out of business. Somebody talked trash about you. Some other thing's going on. And you got a minute to process that because we got to get going on to our PT and then we can, it's just absurd, right? You guys are all laughing, but I'm like, this is what I deal with on a daily basis. I'm like, you listen to too many podcasts. Stop. All that stuff on there is great. I love meditation. I love journaling. I love movement and water, but this is absurd, right? I feel like sometimes when like our clients come in and I even know myself personally, I'm like, yo, you don't have children. You clearly don't have a business to run. Like, you have a 90-minute routine in the morning. You don't have a life. Like, oh, you're a rich 40-year-old entrepreneur in Silicon Valley. Cool. That works. The rest of us, that ain't going to work, right? And athletes, certainly not. They've got all these obligations and things to do. This is not going to happen. And so the reality of it is, again, one more time, although anything on that list I support could be great. It's very similar to what JJ just said. 
These are just different tools. The question not becomes, does this tool work? It becomes when and how and what's best in that situation with that context. And that's really what we spend a lot of our time doing is trying to figure out for you specifically, I need gratitude journaling and some water. For you, yes, water would be good. And yes, gratitude journaling would be great. But actually what's most important for you is I want your HRV score. How about you? I don't care about your HRV. Don't worry about it. Make sure you're talking to your wife. We need kid time. And so it's really finding what lever can we push the most to get the most impact with these high performers because that's the honest reality of life because you just can't have that, right? And I, again, I feel like some of the times in social and public communication, it's like you give them all the tools in the world and they're just like, cool, what do I do? And then you're either stepping over a dime to pick up a dollar, or stepping over a dollar to pick up a dime or you're having really ridiculous schedules. So when you look at some of the athletes that I coach, and you think, oh my gosh, how do we actually get success across? Just look at the top row, right? You're talking about some of the world's best golfers, but you're talking about a 27-year-old who's 6'3", 250 pounds, and then a 50-year-old who's 5'6", 140 pounds. How do we have success across age and size in these folks, even in the same sport? And then you even cross the bottom row when you're thinking, how do we have success in a golfer versus a football player? A 400-pound player versus a cornerback versus a quarterback. The demands are incredibly different among all these people. And then it gets really fun. You cross over into things like this. And now we're talking folks that have to dramatically reduce their body weight 20% or more in a matter of weeks. We're dropping 10% of body weight in a couple of days. We have to compete over five rounds. We have 20-year-olds on that board. You have 44-year-olds on that board. You have weightlifters and powerlifters. You have endurance athletes that compete multiple days in a row. You've got uh, Steffi Cohen down there. I think she weighed 119 pounds in that bikini. And I think that day she deadlifted 550 at 119 pounds. Not too bad, right? And so we have all these demands. And the reason we have success in all these and had had them is because there's a Satan single one thing that connects them all. And it's just physiology. I don't have to care what sport you're playing. It's a whole bunch of metrics that are just physiology. And so if I can make sure those are in the right spot, your sport coach can handle your sport-specific training. That's not my job. You feel me here? So just dial up physiology with whatever tools we need and then let them go run wild. And so I, the kind of theme in my laboratory when I built it in 2011 was how do we take an idea like this and make it real? How do we do science and figure out how to translate into application? And so we have this little saying called from muscle to gene and everything in between. And so we want to run up and down this chain and look is this something at the molecular level, something at the cellular level? Is this an organ system idea or is this a human concept we have to get to? And that's where our coaching comes into practice. And you can see we've published papers in all areas of that. We've done stuff at the gen genetic and epigenetic level. We've done stuff at the tissue level and then all the way down to the bottom, which is like how to, this entire perspective of, of human approach and performance and done stuff there. And I can really boil our entire coaching practice and scientific practice down into these three steps. And we really want to take a lot of attention to analyze all three. Input, processing, and output. The reality of it is, you as a human care about number three, right? You don't really care about how your acetyl-CoA is being metabolized. You care about your energy. Right? You don't really care about how your ileum is breaking down food or whatever it's doing. You care about not being bloated and farting all the time, right? This is the honest reality. You care about the output. But I have to look at output first because that's the thing I care about the most. And then I'm going to go back to input and processing and try to figure out where is the issue. If I'm not seeing the output I want, is it an input issue or is it a processing issue? I solve that one thing and now watch what happens to that output and everybody's happy. I'm not going to go through this entire list, but you get the basic idea, right? This is not entirely complete, but you would see the concept, right? When it comes to input, I want to know everything that goes on or in your body, right? From what kind of food you ate, how much, what time, where did it come from, right? All the way to things like inputs, like psychologically, what are your psychological stressors? What's your emotional stressor? Uh, where do you live? What's in the air? What's in your environment? All of those things are going on or in your body, and we want to have some account for that. Then I want to see how all that is processed, right? Because the reality of it is scare tactics are real. There are toxins, and you also have a bunch of metabolic processes that handle them just fine. So I'm not just concerned about something in your water if I'm not seeing any evidence that your body cares about it. So how are you processing and how are you handling it? 
what's the speed of that processing? What's the efficiency of it? What's uh, the accuracy of it? Do we need to look at blood or stool or urine or, or saliva or any other aspect of it? Again, processing. How's your memory? How's your decision making? How's your skill? Those are all processing issues, right? Mental health. How are you processing that emotion? Which is not what we do, but you get it, right? We're taking account for it. Because at the end of the day, at the bottom, what you're after is those three things. How do you look? How do you feel? And how do you perform? And I'm going after one or all three of those things in every single person. Either don't like the way you look, that's up for you to decide. Either don't like how you're performing or want to perform better, you define perform. Great, you tell me that definition, I'll work off that. And then lastly, you want to feel a certain way. I don't feel energetic, I don't feel happy, I don't feel whatever it is you don't feel, I don't feel strong. Great. Some of that's real, some of that's perception, we're going to take advantage of all of it. And then, of course, we'll see the waste at the end, right? So what's the waste coming out of you? That's our entire system. That's the big secret. Like, that's everything that we do. I don't think we're missing anything for the most part. That first and second part will be the... Right, so something's going to go in your body. You're going to process it a certain way. That's going to determine the output. But here's the thing. At the bottom, that's telling you how. How are you performing? How are you feeling? I don't know why you're feeling, though. And that's where those first two layers come in. Why are you feeling that way? Why are you performing that way? Why are you not progressing? Why are you not gaining muscle? Why are you not gaining fat? Why are you still struggling with sleep? Why are you not getting this thing in? I got to go up the chain to figure that out. So that process we call the biomolecular athlete is comprehensive physiological analysis for high precision and effective solutions. Remember the perfect athlete schedule? I don't have to do that. Because our, comp our analysis is so comprehensive, we can come back and say, you need just A and B. Doesn't mean I'm saying C, D, and E are fake or don't work or wouldn't be good, but I really, for your precise and effective solutions, need these two things. Could be nutrition, could be hydration, could be supplementation, could be mental health, like it could be any number of things that we come back for. You guys down with this? Pretty dope, huh? It's fun. A little more directly, this is what we're looking at. We're doing extensive data collection, and it is slightly individualized. Um, so I'm not going to take, say, physical performance testing of a, a, of a golfer through the same performance testing exactly that I would take our executive clients. It doesn't make necessarily as much sense. There's some sports specificity that goes in. But honestly, the individualization is fairly small because we still are looking at a lot of the same collective things. We're going to find what we call performance anchors. You see the graphic? Pretty cool, right? Get it? It's an anchor. See? I just got the, like, I'm in class chuckle. Yes, I got it, professor. Ha ha. It wasn't as bad as, like, yes, dad, super funny. So I got a little better of a chuckle there. So I appreciate it. You know how much money I spent on that graphic? The best I got out of it, I'll use is a little bit of a chuckle. Thanks. I'm just kidding. Okay, so we want to find these performance anchors, and these are things that are holding your physiology back. A common theme amongst all these things, despite us having PhDs and degrees and all this stuff in our fields, your physiology and your brain know way more about your personal space than I do. And so my primary goal is to get out of its way. The best and most effective thing I can do is say, just get out of the way and let your body and brain do what it wants to do. It, it has a far better, better grasp of what's going on. But if you're constraining it, you're holding it back with some really silly thing, and I can remove that anchor and then get out of the way, that's base case scenario. I don't want you on a 25 supplement regimen. I don't want you on a 90 minute routine just to get to sleep at night. But I might have to do some of those things to get you to a spot where I can say, okay, this thing is now corrected and we can just get out of the way. And now you can just go live your life with sunshine and water and real food and friends and purpose and relationships and exercise and all that good stuff. That's, that's the default state. That's where I'm trying to go but I might have to get some anchors that you got out of the way first. From there, we're going to have our high-precision targeted solutions, and then we're only going to monitor key metrics for you individually. I might track your sleep. I might not. We might have check-ins on your diet. We might not. We might do different things based on what we're actually trying to go after. And so now that you have the framework of our approach, what I thought I'd spend, uh, frankly, our entire time on, well, half of it is I'm going to go over four of our case studies of real athletes, and then at the end, what I'm going to get into is actually some stuff that's coming in the future in terms of human performance technologies that I thought you would all would, would enjoy seeing. And so the, the case studies I want to go after all center around fatigue. 
Uh, I can tell you right now, by far, it is the, the most common, certainly in our executive coaching program, common thing that we see. Uh, yeah, we see some like gut stuff and we see some other things, but like I don't have as much energy or I'm not do, getting as, doing as well in my workouts or I'm sleepy or I can't sleep. Fatigue, fatigue, fatigue is, is without question the biggest one we see. And so I'm like, let's, let's center on that. And what I want to show you is same exact symptoms, different problems, so different solutions, right? And this is the power of actually being precise with your coaching and your, your practice, however you define it. And not just giving everyone the same diet and not giving everyone the same sleep plan and giving everyone the same supplements. Because you're not going to help a lot of people. You might get lucky and help some. And then others, you're going to make things worse. And so being able to really figure out what's going on and go, have I delayed this enough? You're like, damn it, just get to the first one. I'm like dragging this one out, right? More pity laughs. I'll take pity. You know, I tell my students all the time, there are two things in this world that will get you farther than anything else. Bribery and pity. Right? Just focus on those things, and you'll get as far as possible. That's mentorship, friends. It's next level. So number one, if you were to, to, to dive around and look at the evidence-based causes of fatigue, you would probably never end the internet. I, uh, there are plenty more. I just kind of came up with, like, you would see them in these six broad categories. Many, many others don't only like, kill the... It's just a concept here, Right? And so you can start looking through, and I, and I put them in this order intentionally. Can you all see number one, two, and three? I sure hope to you, anytime someone comes to you with fatigue, the very first place you start is sleep. I feel tired today. Mm, better check your microbiome. What? Like, <laughs> no. Like, you probably have a B6 micronutrient deficiency. Did you sleep last night? No. It's definitely the B6. MTA, MTHFR. That's definitely what it is. You're an MTHFR methylation. Like, you don't sleep. Let's, can, we, can we agree to start there? Fantastic. Secondly, like, what did you eat? Haven't eaten, ate too much, like all that stuff, right? Thirdly, hydration. And the reason I bring those up there is because they're all the cheapest, they're all within your control, and they have this most acute effect. If you eat something, change your hydration status right now, you will feel different tomorrow. You can A-B test these things really quickly, right? The next ones are now more expensive and nebulous and, and comprehensive and difficult to interpret and are co-founded by many things, but you might have to go there too. Now, our program, we do it all at the beginning anyways because our, our people have more money than they have time. You laugh. <laughs> I'm not kidding. But the honest reality is it's like, hey, we got eight weeks before this world championship. It's like, I can't A-B test something for three weeks. It's like, no, no, if we wasted 200 bucks on a Genova kit, who cares? Like, they just, they don't care, right? They got an opportunity. We have 70 days before Olympic trials and rowing for Paris. Like, I, it doesn't matter, right? 300 bucks, sure, go do it. So the very first one here you're going to see is interesting, right? Now, here's the common one, and boy, can I tell you how many times I've had to answer this one. I have low testosterone, or I think I have low testosterone. Okay, why? Because I'm tired all the time. Well, did we look at your sleep yet? That's not important. It's the low testosterone thing that's killing me. <laughs> sure about that? Like, sure, if you're low testosterone, yeah, you're like, okay, great, but like, there are other things, and additionally, if your testosterone is low, and there's a whole conversation about what that even means, how do you know that's the cause and not the symptom? Is that the reaction? Well, what caused the testosterone to be low to begin with? Right? And, and there's a whole number of things, but in, in, in our experience, it's a very solvable problem, typically. With, and because I told you earlier, we don't, I'm not a medical doctor, so we don't do any any medicine whatsoever. I don't do any hormones or therapies. Our people can't do it anyways. We have WADA and USADA testing. But even our executive clients, like we just, you want to cross that bridge, go see an MD. I'm not against it at all. My, problem, my, my point of making this is like, there's a lot of other solutions for testosterone. And so the individual, lots of this is a UFC fighter, all kinds of fatigue problems. Testosterone was in fact low and sleep was terrible. And so here's what we did. Sleep, by far, is the biggest performance enhancer we know of. I could go on and on, but I will stop right here. 80% of sleep disorders go undiagnosed. That number used to be 90% a few years ago. Um, thank you, Matthew Walker. Right? For good, bad, or worse, the information has gotten out there, so more people are getting tested. Um, there are still somewhere between 3 or 30 to 50 million people thought of to thought that there have sleep disorders in America alone. I don't know what that number is. If that's real, who knows? If it's 5 million, it's still a lot of people. 
If it's one million, it's a lot of people. Point is, uh, sleep is, is actually, despite the fact we always say it, it is actually your biggest lever to move by far. You got a lot of options in this, um, but oops, let's see. You could get, you could go, like some people will go and get a, a sleep study done in a lab, and you can absolutely do that. But my analogy there is like, it's kind of like a crappy x-ray. So imagine you went in and you're like, man, I think I tore my ACL. And you went in and you got an x-ray and your doctor was like, well, no broken bones, you're good to go, your knee's fine. Like, that's what a sleep study is in a hospital. You don't have a clinical checked box for a clinical sleep disorder, therefore your sleep is fine. And everyone's like, yo, I still felt like death. I can't get to sleep, or I wake up a ton, or I wake up and I feel awful in the morning, whatever the case is. So going to a hospital and getting a sleep study done is, is not necessarily the greatest option here. Um, so again, conflicts of interest is disclosed here. I have a sleep company, Absolute Rest, that does this. And this is effectively what we do. We build sleep labs in everyone's house that is wireless. So you can run a sleep lab in your house. This is FDA approved, clinical sleep study. Many times you want anywhere you want without any wires. So we do that on everybody regardless because there's a lot of things that go into your sleep. So not only can we get a full rundown of your sleep without any like, you know, cheap consumer version wearables, we actually run full uh, clinical grade stuff. But we're looking at a handful of things. Of course, if you have a sleep pathology, we're looking at your psychology, physiology, and environmental factors, and all this stuff can go into performance, and I could drown you in reasons why even going from good to great sleep can enhance performance. And so again, we're running this stuff all the way up and down, and the reason we're doing this is because this will tell us exactly how you're sleeping. Most wearables will do that. Not the same level that we can, even close, but they're gonna tell you how. But none of them tell you why. And so you don't know what to do to fix it. You have to figure out, well, why? I know, thank you, Aura Ring, for telling me I woke up 50 times last night. Like, yes, amazing, I took me an hour to fall asleep. That's helpful, nothing against Aura, right? But you get the point. It's like, well, why? And then what do I do to fix that? And then you go into podcast stand and then look out, you're back to optimal schedule, right? And so we're doing all this stuff. We're doing blood and saliva and, and longitudinal evaluations, and we're trying to figure out why you're sleeping that way. And one I wanted to highlight, and I'll give you fair warning, this happens rarely, but it does happen. Okay, so I'm kind of, I'm kind of playing the devil here a little bit on purpose. But the environmental sensor that we use that we analyze your room with is important. You may or may not realize, and I know you can't read those papers, but there is enough research now on carbon dioxide concentrations. Oh, I sh oh man, I blew it. I should have brought it in this room right now. I guarantee you the CO2 levels are super high in this room. So much so, well, they're absolutely affecting your cognition. No doubt about it. Um, there's lots of research on that, actually. You can see in this data there, actually, I think I've highlighted a little bit there, but um, I have a paper in review right now led by Greg Potter, um, who's got a PhD in, in sleep, some area of sleep, but there's nine kind of colloquial areas of environmental analysis that you'll want to pay attention to. You're aware of most of them, light, sound, temperature, but you're probably not aware of the other ones. And CO2 is a really good example of one of those. Very clear evidence, you start going over 900 parts per million in your room of CO2, and you're gonna dramatically start reducing sleep onset, how long it takes you to fall asleep, sleep quality, waking events, next day restfulness, next day cognitive function, independent of your perception. So this stuff's really great. People rate themselves as feeling fine cognitively, despite the fact that their actual performance on cognitive tests goes in the tank. So this is a really, really clear established relationship. You can see this in a lot of different areas. So what happens is, effectively, if you're laying there, and particularly if you have, you're inhabiting a room with multiple people, you and your, your partner are in the same room, if there's another child or something like that, if there are other animals, cats and dogs, all of you are breathing out CO2 every time you exhale. If all the doors are shut and the ventilation is closed and everything is there, all you're doing is sucking out all the oxygen and kicking out CO2. So then the CO2 concentrations in that room rise. You rebreathe that CO2. Do any of you know what happens when you rebreathe CO2? I'll show you. Can you do me a big favor, please? Put your feet flat on the ground and sit up with a nice, good posture. Don't smash your diaphragm. When I ask you to, which is in about three seconds, can you take a giant, big breath in all the way in? One, two, three. Big breath in. And just hold that until I tell you. Don't exhale. Hold that until I tell you. What you don't realize is when you take a big breath in, you suck in O2. In response to metabolism, in fact, this is what metabolism is, whether you're using fats or carbohydrates, ah, I'm not supposed to say that word right now, carbohydrates, wrong conference, right? You're breaking those things down, and either way, the byproduct is carbon dioxide. That is filling up your 
your blood with carbon dioxide, ideally, that carbon dioxide will go to your lungs. You then exhale that lung. However, lack of O2 is not what you're feeling right now. What you're feeling, no giggling. God damn it, I said no giggling. Oh, now you did it too. We're ruined. Keep holding. I didn't say exhale. The sensation you're feeling, this air hunger, is not a result of O2 lacking. It is CO2 building up. All right, you can breathe out. Cool. How many of you feel like you could doze off right now? Probably not, right? It's like, oh, I could totally nap right now. You can't, right? CO2 is one of the primary sensors in your body that regulates what's happening metabolically. Your brain is paying attention to this. So you have chemoreflexors that are telling you what's going on. You have many of these signals, but it is one of the primary drivers between psychology and physiology. A physiological stressor tells the brain, hey, get alert, get focused, get anxious. A psychological stressor does the exact same thing, kicks off the same epinephrine cascade, tells your entire physical body, get ready for fight or flight or freeze. That's what it's telling you to do, right? It's great. It's not good, bad. So if you're rebreathing that CO2, you feel exactly like how you felt five seconds ago. Now, I exaggerated the point, right? You don't really feel like that. But on a mild level, you start to feel like that. And then you wonder why you're waking up the next day and not feeling great. You didn't have a high quality sleep. Guess what? There's not a single wearable on the market that'll test that. This is all you folks who are like, my sleep score was great, but I still feel like garbage. Never heard of that, right? Never heard anyone say, oh, my sleep score is great. Of course it is. Right? Sure. So environmental factors are very real. Again, I told you at the beginning, it's not super common. The example that I just gave you all, uh, is an easy fix. First, get your animals out of the room. Yeah, right, right? <laughs> all of you were like, sure. I have two puppies and they sleep right at the end of my bed. For sure, no chance. And they're not small either. They're shepherd mixes, like they're there. It is what it is. Um, get your kids out of the room. Get your spouse out of the room. <laughs> okay, if you're not going to do that, just open up your door to your bedroom. If you can, have your windows open as much as possible. In fact, most of the research on the, this area, our studies is exactly like that. They're typically in urban areas and people that are in like apartments and they can't control ventilation and the CO2 numbers start, start to get astronomically high. So if you can get that stuff on, worst case, have a fan on. Don't have that fan on your face. Don't have that fan too loud. You want to stay below 35 decibels. It starts to mess with sleep. At that point, super, super quiet. 35 decibels is actually way quieter than you think. It starts at negatively. Uh, white noise is not always a great option. Um, can, can make sleep even worse as well. So don't make sure you're, make sure you're not blowing that fan on your face because then you're going to hydrate your mouth and have other issues. But that's a real thing. And, and like I said, oh, I zoomed in one of the papers there. So you can actually see again this one right here. And you can see in the red there, both subject or the green, both subjective and physiological results showed that sleep quality decreases significantly with the increase in CO2 concentrations up to 3,000 parts per million. You're unlikely to see your house at 3,000 parts per million. I don't want to like oversell this. Um, it, I, I, my house, if like my wife and two kids and two dogs are kind of running around and it's cold out or whatever and the, the windows are all shut, uh, sometimes we're at like 2,000. I'm like, ah, crap. And I got to open the stuff. So like you would have to do some gnarly stuff to get to 3,000. But can you see the green at the bottom? Can all of you read that? A linear positive correlation. You know what that means, right? Was found between sleep onset latency, CO2 concentrations, while a linear negative correlation was found between slow wave sleep, that's your deep sleep, and CO2. It'll change your sleep. So all you out there trying to hack your deep sleep with different supplements and stuff, just open your window. Anyways, you can see the data there. That's number. This is from one of our real clients, that UFC fighter that I'm still on about. And that's 900 right there. And you can see he's just routinely over it, uh, that line, like pretty substantially. Mm, 1,300 is enough to start messing with you, no doubt. It's not enough to really tank you, but you'll, you'll notice a small marginal effect there. And so if I go back to this person, you can see this is actually our full breakdown of their sleep of his sleep, and we put it in these different quadrants, and he had problems all over the place. You see the environmental one at the top. That was one of them for sure, physiological ones, behavioral stuff. But we actually didn't mess too much of the CO2, despite the fact that it was too high. I told you it was 1,300 or so, because when we did the full evaluation, look how we scored in psychology. 0 for 4. And when we dove that even harder, we have subcategories. 
depression, anxiety, trauma, and screening, and he flagged for five out of six, five out of five, five out of five. I don't need to give him like a special algae plant in his room to kick out a little bit more O2. He needs a therapist. That, that, that's the honest reality. So we're like, yo, do that. And he's just like, this whole evaluation, and, and I'm like, yeah, because there's nothing I can do with your CO2 that's going to get you past your PTSD and your trauma, right? That's, that's the honest reality. So his performance anchor, the biggest one for sure, was his psychological state. You feel me? You see how this shakes out? Again, I could have given this dude all the magnesium 3 and 8 in the world. <laughs> Wouldn't have mattered, right? No apigenin is going to help him there. Like, you need real, actual work there. Yeah, anyways. Can you, can you guess what this dude's success has been, by the way, with sleep supplements? Zero. Everything in the world. You could pile them on. It has no effect. Yeah, well, there's a couple reasons why. One of them I won't mention, but the other one would be, yeah. <laughs> this is what's going on, right? Now, I'm going to move on from sleep, but I do want to throw this one out here. I'm going to give you no context on. Please, for the love of all mercy... Don't hack or try to coach around sleep stages based on your tracker. Oh, I don't get enough deep sleep. I'm going to take this because don't do that. For a trillion reasons, just do not do that. Your brain knows exactly what it wants to do with sleep. I think there's a couple of people kicking around this conference that do stuff on the brain. Maybe talk to them. But let your brain do what it wants. All right, next example I'm going to give you, and this is a short one. I gave you a long one. We'll come back with a real short one. It was one of our female clients. And uh, this is a case of like, Again, it doesn't happen often, but this was a legit fungal infection. All right, and so we were able to actually, thank you, Genova. This is a Genova test we ran. Blew off the charts uh, uh, for a bunch of yeast infection. A lot of folks at this conference, like you're probably somewhat aware of that. Here's the classic paper. Everyone goes through the Cater paper there uh, on candida and chronic fatigue from years ago. And so there's association there, and you'll see this in a lot of different areas. Infections will make you tired. And so the reality of it is this individual did have a real infection, that was there for a very long time, and, and all that, all we had to do was clear that infection up, and she was like, changed her life. So that person had a legit infection, went to a medical doctor, got that taken care of, got it like confirmed on a real test, and then, and then got it taken care of. And it was, this was great, because it was like the greatest coaching experience ever, because we're like, yep, don't need to change your diet, don't need to change your workout, don't have to change anything. Go take that thing, and all of a sudden she's just like, you gave me my life back. We're like, yeah, yeah. It's us. It's totally our meditation routine. It was definitely our breath work that did it and not your fungal infection. All right, again, that's all medical stuff. Is that short enough for you? I told you this one's short. Don't have infections, friends. They're not good. Next one is uh, an actual NFL player. Now, this was fun because symptomology and labs were almost identical to the UFC fighter. But now this was not like a, hey, go see a therapist thing. This was, we finally get to coach here. Because we got to poke into his blood chem a little bit, right? And now you all are smart individuals. You can probably take a look at what's going on here. Four that I highlighted out, insulin and specifically sex hormone binding globulin and testosterone, free and direct, right? So now what's interesting there is, take a look at this. Insulin's a little bit low. Sex hormone binding globulin's high. And then testosterone's low. Well, why is testosterone low? Because what was high? Sex hormone binding globulin, right? So why is that low? Or why is that high? Because insulin was low. Okay, great. You can pull up papers on this, but you will see some evidence for an inverse relationship between insulin and sex hormone binding globulin. Not always the case, but can be the case. Interesting. So we start poking around. We don't have to, but here you go. Let's look at what happens. Systematic review, meta-analysis, regression on the effects of carbohydrate and sleep. You probably can't see this in the bottom here, but there are very, very, very strong association between carbohydrate intake and quality of sleep, sleep architecture, and overall restfulness. Not saying, again, nobody throw darts at me right now at the keto conference. Like, sorry, Dom. <laughs> but yes, there is an association between there. You can certainly have great sleep without carbohydrates. Absolutely. It's, it's not a problem. And I'm certainly not saying overboard, right? Don't over thing. This is just an association. Associations mean association, right? But there certainly are uh, strong associations between those. And so the reality of it is, this is an NFL player consuming 125 grams of carbohydrate a day. That put him like in the death zone. Definitely was not on a ketogenic diet. It just was on like moderate carbs. So not like low enough and then high enough in fat to really 
see some benefits of keto, and then not enough carbohydrate for his day. So again, like miracle coaching cure figured out all of his fatigue and all these problems solved because we gave him like 100 grams of carbohydrate today. And you know when we gave it to him? What time of the day? <gasps> right before bed. And guess what he did? And then what happened to his testosterone? Ho, 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 stunner of the year, right? Yeah. We don't generally give people, like, we don't have to go out of our way and do that. But for him, we're like, all right, you, you don't have that. Insulin got taken care of. Testosterone went up. He felt great. Bada bing, bada boom, right? Right tool, right job. Again, you're still talking 250 grams of carbs a day for an NFL player. Like, it's not high at all for them, for what they do. So, huge success story there. Um, and for an NFL player, that's about as much as you're going to get them to do in season. It's like, can you eat more food? Yeah, copy that. Like, win. Yes. And remember, in this case, not only is TRT not an option for a player, but we didn't need to do it anyways. It just went right back up on its own. Um, can you guess, by the way, like, <laughs> part of this, when we saw this stuff, can you guess what the, some folks in his circle were trying to tell him why his testosterone is low? When you think NFL player, low testosterone, what's the first thing you think they're going to think is going on? And that's for sure real, right? Like brain injury. Um, like, totally possible, but then also add, how about we eat carbs? Done. All right. So like it, Occam's razor sometimes works, friends. Occam's razor. So in particular him, uh, again, just low carb issue. Just for his demands, it wasn't enough. Now, I'm going to stick on, on blood chemistry a little bit more because I think it's really important. It is by far the most robust marker you can use. It has the most science. If we're comparing this to something um, in other areas of, of performance that you all might be interested in, like a, a breath test or something like that, all those things might be okay. But blood chemistry is, is the foundation of all of the, the biomarkers you can go after without question. There's over 4,000 uh, last count of, of different markers you can order. And so there's a lot of things to choose from. You can get anything tested. Not all of them are good, but there are thousands that have thousands of papers on them. And so it really is your best place to start if you want actual hard physiology biomarkers. The other thing I like about it the most is it allows you to play detective a little bit. If you contrast this to something like a stool sample, a stool sample is going to give you an indication for the most part of what's happening in that local system. And even in actuality, like subparts of that system. And that's great, but blood chemistry is going to give you information about every organ in your body that has blood supply, which is all of them. <laughs> right? Like everything has a blood supply that you care about. And so you can get insights on your kidney or liver or brain or skeletal muscle or anything else. Blood chemistry gets you that. So I'm not against stool samples at all um, when used appropriately. But blood chemistry is, is like the place where I'm like, I don't want to skip this ever for any reason for the most part because I'm going to get a little bit of insight into other, many other places, okay? Now, in fairness, to give you both sides of this conversation, there are some extremely legitimate concerns with blood chemistry, and I'll, I don't think I actually have to convince this crowd this much, but number one, you guys know what I mean when I say old reference ranges? Like when you get your labs back and it says like the reference range, are you high or low? Those reference ranges are not exactly up to date. That, that's the kindest way I can say that. <laughs> like very kindly say they're a little bit old. Every company has different ranges as well, so it's not like a, a standardized system. The second concern is what I'll call sick database. And, and I, you all really know what I'm talking about when I say that. No one in this room wants to be compared and told, you look okay relative to a bunch of sick people. What do you want to know? In fact, I, want to, I guarantee you right now, if you're in this room, you want to know, yo, how do I stack up next to that person directly next to me? This is a pretty healthy room, right? I guarantee you, if I could give you all labs and you could know what your reference range is relative to everyone in this room, wouldn't you like that? If I said, yo, you can pay the same amount of money and you're going to get compared to people in the next room over, not in this conference, but like, the conference of whatever else, or this room, which one would you take? Right, because everyone in this room is probably pretty healthy compared to the general public. And then some of you are like even better than some of the rest, and some of you want to win, right? Like, fuck yeah. <laughs> Healthiest person at this healthy conference, right? <laughs> yes. 
can we get some sort of prize or award for that next year? Yes, whoever has the best blood labs in this metabolic conference, like, gets a plate of pasta. Ah! Trick! Trick! Gotcha! But that's not how blood chemistry works, right? You are compared against national databases, Mayo Clinic, Cleveland Clinic, Anne Haynes, and UK Biobank, and like, those are not healthy people on aggregate, right? Like, so you, you need to be able to pay attention to your markers outside of those reference ranges. And most people are aware of point one and two. Number three, though, is where people generally don't understand at all, and that is interactions. So when you look at a blood marker like testosterone, you don't just want to go, okay, this number is high, therefore I want to take it down. Because you've got to figure out why. It might be being pulled up by one thing, pulled down by something else, and end up in the middle. And so that becomes a problem. You have to understand how things interact, and that's exactly like that case study just showed you. This is up because this is down because that's down. Physiology is complicated. You don't always like, no, 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 no. But when you've done it enough times, you can start to get a feel of like, hey, I'm pretty confident. And that's as good as we can do in science, right? Science doesn't prove anything. It just reduces uncertainty. So we have enough papers on it. I have enough coaching practice so we can be pretty certain this is going to give you a good chance. No promise ever, no guarantee. We can just reduce uncertainty. So let me give you some examples of this. Now, this is ferritin. Um, ferritin, you're all probably somewhat aware of, is like a, like a nice kind of backwards way to look at inflammation. I actually had one of our clients came back, uh, what's today, Friday? Wednesday. He was 850. His ferritin levels were 850. And guess what he feels like? And the answer is not good. Extra exhaustion all the time, right? He's just like totally exhausted, can't get it all figured out. Like, yeah, okay, your ferritin is double reference range, and that reference range is out of control. Now, depending on which lab you look at, that number will be different, and I will give you like my personal guess, although I have no inside information here. Um, I think those reference numbers are going to come down pretty soon because there's enough evidence on ferritin that like you do not want to be at 400. That's a pretty darn high number. Uh, recent papers came out, even actually suggesting you can see kind of the bottom there, but you probably want to be like maybe at 100 or lower. But if you did this lab and you were at 398, they'd be like, well, you're normal. In fact, you want me to make it worse? If you came back at like 420, they'd probably be like, well, you're just outside the reference range. It's not that bad. You know, what I mean? you know exactly what I mean when I say that, right? It's like you just have a little bit of diabetes, not that much though. <laughs> it's like, it's not a lot that much diabetes, just a little bit, you're fine. So you don't want to be there, right? Um, I, what does optimal reference range mean? I don't have a dang clue, but I certainly know that 400 is probably not great. Especially, again, when there's data down there suggesting, hey, 20 to 100 is probably like something that's a little bit better. Uh, everyone has heard of homocysteine. This is another good one. You all have heard of this one, right? Like, and then I pulled up, again, nothing against Cleveland Clinic if you're here right now. Sorry, didn't mean to offend you, but like this is, that's the reference range, 5 to 15, despite the fact that that's what happens. <laughs> like, you can start crawling up that number, and you get to 15, and you start seeing associations with things you don't want to be associated with. Am I saying they're causal? I don't have an idea. That's not my area. But I don't even want to be associated with that. And that's still in your reference range. Right? So, like, paying attention to these things is a real problem. You don't want to, like, be anywhere in that stratosphere if you got a good test, okay? Am I scaring you all enough yet? Because I'm going to keep scaring you. This is going to get worse before it gets better, friends. All right? Here's another one, basic blood chem there. And you start seeing some, see, you know what cracks me up about this one? Do you guys know, what's C-peptide roughly? What, like, what information is that telling you? Someone, like, tell me. Yeah, I can tell you that. Well, yeah, that's exactly what it is, right? Why would you be concerned if it's a little bit low? Like, so this marker is like flagged for being too, it's like, oh, I have a little bit less inflammation. <laughs> Damn. Okay. Reference range, 4.4, but you, there are associations. Again, these are all associations. Like, they're definitely not causations. And that, associations run, right? So it's like a little bit, a little bit, a little bit more. But you probably don't want to be anywhere in that unless you have context of what happened in that person and what happened in the last 24 hours, right? That's what really going to tell you. Blood glucose, and this one, I had to highlight this one for this conference, right? Like, you definitely don't want to be at 99. That is a reference range, and I promise you, you are not healthy at 98 or 95. You don't want to be low either. 81's good, actually. Pretty good. 
But you start seeing things kick, kick, uh, kick up a retinopathy over 95 and, and things like that. Again, of all crowds I've ever been in, this is one where I don't have to convince you you don't want blood glucose at 97, right? Like, not a good idea if that's what you chronically are. Um, now, in this particular case, of course, you all are aware how variable blood glucose is. Don't overinterpret a single blood glucose marker. Like, you know, I, I wouldn't, if I got one, in fact, I have actually had in the last, oh, probably, I think it was December, I had my own blood, came back, it was like 94, and I was like, no. And then came back, it's like, okay, it's perfect. So, blood glucose is finicky. But there you go. Some of you are thinking, yeah, it's 94, you eat carbs, I told you. It didn't, it's normal, okay? It's fine. But this is another one that drives me bananas. And this is the old, how many of you have heard this? Like, if you don't have enough muscle, that's bad, right? You know that under-muscled is a, is a real metabolic problem. And then some folks also say, yeah, but too much muscle is bad. And that's because there's a lot of papers in fancy journals that have found associations with inverted U's like this. That say, hey, too much muscle is actually a problem for aging. I'm trying to calm down right now. I'm going to catch my breath and go a little bit slowly here. But this is really an issue, um, and we can put some strong data behind this, actually, and to kind of round out this point, because of this. Oh, look at that. You might, anyone recognize these faces running around? Is Christy here? Oh, shame. She didn't even come to my talk. Tommy's here. Tommy's up in the front row over there in the corner. You guys can say hi to Dr. Tommy Wood. He probably saw him earlier. see him later. Um, but this is Christie's paper. Tommy led this uh, out of their group. He was kind enough to let me be a small part of it, and I mean extremely small. Um, but this is really, like, I think helpful to that point. So this paper was published, um, what, uh, what, about January? When was it published, Tommy? Yeah, six months ago or so it came out, so I could update that thing. But this is right, strength uh, and multiple types of physical activity, but not low muscle mass are independent predictors of cognitive function. And NHANES. If you're not familiar with NHANES, that's one of those big databases that we can pull from, right? It's where we get normative values and, and lots of stuff. It's a really important data set that people can use. But I'll kind of summarize um, Christy and Tommy's paper here. Number one, strength and physical activity, but not muscle mass, were independent predictors of cognitive function in this group. All right? Chew on that. Their physical strength and their physical activity, but not their muscle mass, was independent predictors of cognitive function. So how strong you were, and I believe this was grip strength or leg extension. Leg extension strength. Leg extension strength predicted cognitive function. That's cool, number one, right? But we already knew that. But like, we really confirmed it here. But muscle mass did not. And also, their muscle mass was not related to their strength. No other physical activity. So what's that tell you about their muscle mass? Their muscle mass was not associated with their physical activity in this database. Which means they did not gain their muscle from lifting weights. Fair summary? Now at this point you're all still very confused. Like, so what does this mean? Well, if you have a lot of muscle and you gained said muscle from things not associated with exercise, what did you probably gain them from? Things that are not associated with good for your health. So now, if you go back to the previous chart and you're like, aha, in those databases, when you have too much muscle, that's bad for your health. Or are you just a really big person? And that's not good for your health. You feel me now? Cool. This is why you don't want to be compared to these databases. These are not databases of extremely healthy people. All right? The last one then here is your interpretation problem. Now, <laughs> albumin is the classic one. I love it. It is awesome. It's what carries a lot of stuff through your blood, like your cortisol and a bunch of other cool things. But it is an acute phase reactant, which means it will go down with the inflammation and go up with dehydration. So, can any of you ever envision a scenario in which you are a little bit dehydrated and a little bit inflamed? Not because you drank a bunch of dry farms wine. <laughs> Although that would definitely do it, right? But not that one. Like all other wine, but not that one. I've never had it. It's probably great. Any of you have it last night? Was it amazing? Is it amazing as I have it envisioned in my head? Great. Awesome. 
That will definitely not do it. Probably elevates your testosterone. Just kidding, right? Um, but no, any other scenario, right, in which you have decreased inflammation or you have inflammation and a little bit dehydrated, I don't know, like you exercise? Great. What happens if I tug up and tug down? Where does albumin go? You can all do math, right? One up, one down equals what? <laughs> Zero, right? So you, this is a classic case of if you're high, dehydrated and a little bit inflamed, You ever have that one happen? Mm, labs look fine. I don't feel fine. Mm, they look fine. You know what the worst is? You know what the typical response to this one is? Just go take a couple of weeks and back off. Just go relax. Yeah, yeah, I feel like death. And you can tell me relax. So the interpretation of blood chemistry like, has to be done with a judicious eye because of context like that, right? It's like, okay, can you confirm hydration with osmolality or urine-specific gravity or some other thing? Can we do some other way? What are the other markers of inflammation? Can we look at those things and go, oh, okay, although albumin's there, I can pretty well determine you've got A and B going on, so therefore we have a different course of reaction. So while I love blood chemistry the most, be careful, okay? You want to you work with and coach, or in your profession, if you're a clinician, you want to treat people, not labs. You want to treat people and coach people, not labs. Right? Because you can run into problems. The next uh, case study we're going to go over here is a, a golfer. And don't worry, just so I can be clear, none of the golfers in those pictures is this person. So we're fine. And this is great because there is a marker that you're all probably aware of called respiratory rate. This is how often you're breathing. Okay? Now, if you look at the same thing, what's the normal respiratory rate for adults? Can you all see that number? What's it say? It says between 12 and 20. I can promise you right now, if any of you have an overnight respiratory rate of 20 breaths per minute, you are not healthy. I promise you. In fact, <laughs> you can get drive yourself nuts with this thing. Um, my typical 10, 10 and a half or so is my respiratory rate. A couple days ago, um, my immune system decided to not show up to the party. Thank you to my three and five year old. I woke up and I was like, oh wow, respiratory rate's really high. It was like 13 and a half. Felt fine, everything fine. You know where the story ends, don't you? What happened like two hours into the day? Ah, <laughs> oh, shit. All rest of the day, I'm sick, right? Respiratory rate will tell you immediately what's going on in your body. It is the most sensitive marker of anything you could pay attention to that you can test every single day. Now, we do have some of our athletes that we take blood, urine, and saliva on every single day. We can do that at this point. But this one is a canary in the coal mine. This will actually, in my opinion, no offense to anybody, but this one even beats HRV. I will tell what's going on in your body faster with respiratory rate than I will even will your HRV. It's a better responder. And it has less of a buffer. Your HRV will go up and down depending on a lot of different things, so you kind of have to find your own standard deviation. Respiratory rate is going to move quickly when any little thing happens. And you can really get a lot of insight on that. Really cool paper that just came out. Uh, I know that the text is a little bit hard to read, so I'll read you that kind of purpley blue up there. Respiratory rate during sleep was associated with higher weekly perceived stress scores. Oh, oops, can't see it. The effects that persisted after controlling for gender, race, first generation, mental health status, and trauma, things like that. So it is a really important marker, but the green one is the coolest. For every single breath per minute you go up, you increase your risk or your, your rate of experiencing higher stress by 1.25 times, 25% increase. This was done, this was really cool. This is a wearable study done in college freshmen. It's the canary in the coal mine, folks. Like, if your stress goes up, you will see a change in respiratory rate. One breath per minute will move. 25% stress association there. And then in red, the relationship with stress was specific to respiratory rate but was not found in other sleep measures like your HRV, total sleep, sleep efficiency, sleep onset, or wake up count. Those are all fine, but you'll see respiratory rate moving. That's why I love it so much. Right? You can see things coming before they get there. You can have an athlete who just, maybe they're a psychopath and stress doesn't affect them mentally and they just sleep through the night, but their physiology will tell you what's going on. Okay? If you're unaware of what's happening there, um, this is a wonderful paper there, Physiology, Respiratory Driver. But here's what's basically going on. 
When you inhale that O2 and you exhale that CO2, O2 is there for cellular health and metabolism, but your CO2 is the primary regulator of your pH. I'll say that again. CO2 is the primary way you regulate pH. Hypercapnia is high CO2. Hypocapnia is low CO2. If you hold your breath, like I made you do earlier, and you go hypercapnia, and then if we match that, or if we just sit here and hyperventilate, you'll feel, I can, I can, I can make, let's do that. Feet flat on the floor real fast. I'm going to do a little fun little experiment, I promise. I want you to feel this, okay? It's like we're in class. Flat on the floor, Maggie. <laughs> now, feet on the floor, diaphragm not smashed. Um, let's go for uh, 30 seconds on the count. Five, four, three, two, one, go. Hyperventilate. <laughs> Keep going. We all got terrible breath, don't worry. Go. <laughs> Keep going. We are seven seconds in. <laughs> Keep going. Go. <laughs> Anyone feel anything? Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Harder. We're going to go a 10 second burst. Ready? Three, two, one, burst. Go, 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 go. Faster, 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 faster. Five more seconds. Hard as you can. Three, two, one, go. Stop. Feel any different? Anyone feel tingling? Feel a temperature change? Feel excited and lovey? I don't know if that part happens. <laughs> Some people say that and I'm like, I don't feel that at all. Sorry. You change CO2, you change pH, you will feel that immediately, right? What you just went through right there is hypocapnia. CO2 got very, very, very low. Okay? That causes respiratory alkalosis. Do you know what happens in your kidney in response to that chronically? Your body will regulate one single thing over everything else in the entire world. pH. More than blood glucose, although that's important. More than blood pressure, although that's important. Hydration, that's important. pH is a starting place. It will not let you play with pH that much. If you go into chronic respiratory alkalosis, what I just gave you is short-term. That means nothing. But if you are chronically over-breathing, chronically respiratory alkalosis, you will see chronically metabolic acidosis. You will see very commonly metabolic acidosis is incorrectly diagnosed as metabolic acidosis when in reality it is respiratory alkalosis. In response to that, your kidneys will change bicarbonate regulation, It'll change electrolyte concentrations. You're going to see this all over the piece, place with people who wake up and pee all night. Hydration issues, drink a ton of water, still feel thirsty, dry mouth, peeing constantly. We can see this. Overbreathing, respiratory alkalosis, metabolic acidosis. We're going to change total blood, blood volume because we think we're in this spot. We need to regulate pH, and we start changing what the kidneys do. You see, did you see me there? You see the connection there? All this stuff can happen, right? So by changing CO2, we're doing that. If we're chronically over-breathing, that's the state we're putting ourselves in. Now, what you just did there is hyper-exaggerated. Like no one's breathing. We, we were breathing at, I don't know, 60 breaths per minute there. Like no one's walking around like, <laughs> <laughs> but some people aren't that far off, right? It's like, you, you, you ever been on a phone call or like a Zoom meeting with somebody and you're like, geez, like we're just talking. <laughs> like, <sighs> You're like, oh my gosh, they're for sure in respiratory alkalosis and they're probably in metabolic acidosis as a response. Or if they're not, their kidneys are working real hard to manage that pH, right? Your body doesn't want to play with that. So again, you can see there metabolic acidosis or is it really just respiratory alkalosis? You can see in green there, it's highlighted. Chronic respiratory alkalosis is often misdiagnosed as metabolic acidosis. This is what happens, right? So you want to be careful there. This is a really nice review article. And you can kind of see that respiratory rate. The bottom line is breaths per minute. And can you see the green bar, those of you in the back? The green bar starts on your left at 20 breaths per minute. Remember the average? What is normal, 12 to 20? But look at all the things that happen before you even get to 20 breaths per minute. Associated with ex excessive emotional stress, cognitive load, pain, dyspnea, clinical deterioration, cardiovascular risk factors go up. None of us play that game, right? None of us here are like the, well, as long as you're not dead yet, you're fine. Everyone here is super on the like preventative start before it even becomes a problem, right? So I don't want you to be 20. I don't want you to be anywhere near that. 15 is too high. I've yet to meet anybody whose physiology is on point, they feel great, and their breath rate is 15 breaths per minute. So I suppose it could happen, but I just don't think that's the case. You can actually, I cut out a vertical line, but that vertical line, can you see where 15 would be on that chart? Go halfway through 10 and 5. That's how, 10 and 20, that's how math works, okay? 
and run a vertical line, you, you're already on the edge there of emotional stress and pain and, and all those things, right? It's clearly associated with things that are not good for your physiology. 15 is too high. You want that thing far lower than that. Um, if I see 13, 13 and a half, and I don't see any other cause, I, I, I let it slide. But if I'm seeing other things that are associated with, with this, um, again, fatigue or performance or whatever, I'm going, all right, I'm, I'm stepping in. If I see 15 and I don't see any association, I'm still taking action. Because it's just, it's just going to lead to higher. It's just going to keep going. Or it's not in a good spot. All right? So, to come back all the way to this one, this person's performance anchor was respiratory rate. He was over-breathing. Uh, in fact, this individual was like 18 and a half. Right? And guess what his score was on his aura? 95. Like, yeah, how do you feel? Not 95. Well, then we're going to work. All right? Brought that thing way down. So that's kind of uh, the, the stuff I wanted to present to you in terms of, of, of our case studies. Um, what I want to transition to now is a little bit of fun because we haven't had any fun yet. And I want to talk about the future of human performance. So in this, I'm going to share with you some of the projects that I'm working on, some of the technologies that I'm not a part of at all, but the way that I think this human performance space is going, and, and I, I really wanted to bring that to this um, summit because, again, in my opinion, this is exactly what all of you are interested in, which is like, how do we step in before these problems happen? How do we be uh, precision nutrition? How do we really get to precision training? How do we really get to precision uh, coaching and all that stuff, and then what's that actually going to look like? Because the honest answer is we're not there yet, no matter what anybody says. Is that okay? Can we, can we talk about the future a little bit? Yes. I mean, if you don't want to, I'll just, I'm happy to go have some cheeseburgers. <laughs> There's a great pool out there. I'm sure they serve plenty of beer. I'm just kidding, right? Can, can we talk about the future? Are you guys all right with that? Yes. Dom, is this the best I got here? Is this the best your crowd has? And we want, can we talk about the future a little bit here? Yeah. Hey! Now we're getting there. I just had to bring up the man, Dom, and all of a sudden you guys got excited. I don't blame you. I'm a fan too. All right. So in reality, the way that this thing is going to work is the following. You're going to have to collect personal data on people. This is happening already, but it's, it's going to get amplified. We need to know more about you as a person. And from there, we're going to build what's called a digital twin and then run simulations. How many of you have ever been or coached somebody and said something like, try this for a week or a month, and then we'll come back and we'll try something else. You ever done anything like that, kind of A-B tested? Why waste all that time if I can run a simulation on you and you know the answer in under a second? That's the reality of what we're coming, it's, it's coming down to, right? I don't need to figure out which combination of supplements and training I'll work. I can run that all in simulations, figure out the exact answer, and then just give it to you right now. That's where it's going to go, right? That's a digital twin. From there, you still then have to go effectively execute, which means you have to go do the nutrition. You have to do the work. I can't do the physical work for you, right? This is where accountability and motivation and check-ins and all that stuff work, but you have to actually go execute. And then we're going to be able to predict and prevent novel problems from happening with ongoing monitoring, right? So things happen, you pick up new bacterias and change your life schedule and all that stuff. But that is really as complicated as human performance is and will ever get. The question is, how do we get these four things done? None of them are currently perfect at all, but they're getting there, and there are some solutions that are currently available. If you're unfamiliar, how many of you all know when I said digital twin, you're like, yeah, I know exactly what he's talking about. You all know what digital twin is? How about this? How many of you don't know what digital twin is? Well, how about that? See, I told you you want to talk about the future. Next time, clap, okay? Like, clap fast. I, what if I just walked away and said, I'm done here, and we never got this? So the digital twin is this basic idea of saying, if we take every, every organ system in your body, as you can see in the lesser, and throw it all, make a digital copy of it, throw it all into a simulator, and from there we can actually have pers real personalized care. We can better diagnose, we can prognose, we can actually create therapy based specifically on exactly what's happening in your body. If I run simulations on that, then I can figure out what's going on. Um, this is real, by the way. This already happens. All right, they have digital twins of the heart that's already being used in hospitals. So you can get, a, if you needed like a heart procedure, you can go in, they can image your heart, make a digital twin of it. They can run a bunch of different surgery simulations on it, figure out and predict what's most likely to have your best response. And then that's the surgery that they'll go execute. So the heart's already done. It's heart's very simple. Um, work on the lungs is happening right now. The brain, there's a couple of groups that are working on the brain. 
We are nowhere in the stratosphere of understanding how the brain works, but the physical structures is really close. So if, again, figuring out what's going to happen if I cut this piece out or whatever it is, is something I'm working on. Uh, kidneys are going to follow very soon, probably in the next year the kidneys will be out, and they'll be there, right? Now, putting this together into an entire system is, is not there, but, but organ by organ is getting very close. And again, friends, you're talking like a couple of years before this stuff gets done, not like, you know, 50 years from now. The digital twin market is, is small, but as you can see, it's projected to be you know, 50 billion in the next couple of years already. There's lots of data on this. There's a digital twin in many different areas. You can see all kinds of papers. Um, the one on the far left is the hardest one. The immune system is everywhere, right? I can pull your skeletal muscle system out, your nervous system out, but I, I can't pull your immune system out. That's going to be the major challenge. Figuring out a digital twin for the immune system is, is effectively impossible right now, which means it won't be, but it's very long ways away. So that's going to be the challenging one. But the other ones are pretty simple for the most part. It's just a few years away. So there's lots of stuff going on in this area. And we can actually kind of go back in time a little bit. You all know the Human Genome Project, right? I think they started that in 1990 and finished it around 2000 or something like that. And so that was really cool. And it was like, yo, can we sequence the entire human genome, right? And that was... Uh, I don't know, it's like $3 billion or $30 billion, like some crazy amount, and now you can get your genome sequenced for 100 bucks, plus or minus, right? Maybe 500 but you get the point, right? So that went on. In about 2000, they said, okay, we got the genome sequenced. Um, by the way, for the record, like, promise you won't tell anybody, but when they actually came out with that, they weren't actually done. It's not so actually fully sequenced. They just were like, yeah, we put all this money into it. It's been 10 years. We're done. <laughs> like, was it mostly done? But it wasn't all the way done. Like, sneak, don't tell anybody, right? So that was happening, and then right around the same time in like 2000, um, uh, cancer folks were like, yo, can we get a molecular signature of tumors? And so they started that entire project, and you see what they did there. And that's really cool, trying to develop these molecular portraits of, of, of tumors, which is awesome. Came out with that, and there's lots of data on that. Um, some of you may be familiar with the motor pack, the molecular transducers of physical activity. That was like 100 and I think 50 million-ish projects spread across the country from uh, NIH that says, hey, we want to know the molecular aspects of physical activity. And that kicked off in 2015. And that's great. Wu Tsai came on board and said, hey, let's do all this now from the perspective of human performance. And so this stuff is coming. It's been building for 20 plus years. Ugh. This is a really cool paper that came out last year. This is a molecular athlete. This exercise physiology to mechanisms to metals. This was really, really cool. And there is a lot of work going here, but there's not a single thing from any of these projects yet that are actionable. And, and that is the next step we have to take is like, okay, now that we understand the molecular perspectives of what proteins are turned on during aerobic exercise versus strength training, how do I actually take that and give that to somebody and tell them train this way or that way? It's, that that connection is not made. I can't wait for it to happen, but no one's really funding that part of it. It's all just still the back end basic science, which is uh, awesome. Obviously, I have a basic science lab myself. And so, enter in sort of the newest era of this, and this is what we call the human sensor. So, this project is led by my friend uh, Cody Burkhart, who runs Human Works uh, and the NASA. NASA, that's the Human Works division of it. And so, a year, handful of years ago, we, we came together and we're like, can we make a human sensor? such that we can do all these things that I talked about in those first four steps. And so you can actually see this, this is not a part of our project, but I wanted to show you guys some well, wild stuff to be honest with you. Do you all know that there are multiple sensors now that can be put into your mouth? So these are full real-time sensors. There's a bunch of different versions of them. They can, these can measure exactly what's going on, what went in your mouth, uh, the environment, the factors, what food you ate. So you can imagine, like how many of you have ever done food logs? You like tracked and weighed your food and wrote it down or did like an app or something like that. You ever done that? Imagine throwing all that away. Now I don't have to worry about the 20% accuracy margin on the label because the sensor is just directly measuring exactly what went in my mouth. Wouldn't that be a step up? Right? There's a little bit of ethical concerns with all this stuff, but shh, don't worry about all that stuff, right? Can you, can, do any of you have teenagers? Any of you have teenage children? Can you just imagine this? Like, what did you do last night? Like, oh, hang on, my friends. Did you, did you guys drink at all? No, no. Yeah, you drank. You had 12 ounces of Boone's Farm, purple flavor. Like, <laughs> I can see it. I saw it on the sensor. 
So again, some ethical concerns here, sure. I don't want to know. That's, don't, you're scaring me already. I don't want to know. You're further along than I am, and I don't want to know. My kid's five, three. She still, or she already lies to me about what she ate. You guys have cookies at school today? No. Like, I saw the pictures. They put them on the kids' platform thing. I saw them. Right? That happens. Um, that'll also tell you about air quality and water quality and all that stuff can happen. And then there are, um, I'm not involved with this company at all, but it's not even an actual company. This is from a paper, published paper. But there are many companies working on this. I don't know when this is going to be ready, if it is or ever. There's multiple different versions of it. But really, friends, how long? How long until it is? I mean, it's just a matter of short time, right? Entirely different um, company. This is actually Springbok. What they can actually do is run a full body MRI on you. And you can get volumetric assessment of every individual muscle on your body. And so we can start to see things like asymmetries, right? Left group's bigger than the right group. We can see edema. We can see scar tissue. We can see things like that. It's a 20 minute scan and all of a sudden you get a full body assessment of exactly what's going on. You can start seeing this now from like a physical performance and, you know, why is this pain happening and, and all this stuff. They actually have a, I think they have an exclusive contract with the NBA. So all the NBA players coming in go through this scan. So that's available now. And they're in scans. I think they have like, I think they're in basically any MRI provider you have. You just go in there, like buy that scan and then upload their software and do all that. Entirely different direction. There are companies like Axioforce and Plantiga. Plantiga actually just got announced. I just literally saw it last night. The NBA just announced that Plantiga is like now official sponsor, past their third party verification. But these are force plates that go into your soles of your shoes. So have you ever jumped on a force plate or been on a force plate? I don't need any of that stuff because now I can just put a sole in your shoe and I can get a force plate readout every step you take, everything you're doing in games in warm-ups, all that stuff can be read directly out and sent back wirelessly back to you. So those are already out and available companies um, that you can work with. There are also things like Sway Rebuilt and uh, a platform called Enable. So it's an engine for automated biomechanical evaluation. That's actually at the Spurs facility. Um, so you can see that the Spurs could have put a couple of billion in their facility. This is markerless, wireless mocap. So the athlete's shooting there and there's nothing on the athlete at all. These are just sensors that are put around the building, and you're seeing individual real changes in launch angle, joint, full joint kinetic, kinetics and kinematics without any markers, which is pretty dope. All that data then goes back to them. They run simulations on technique and say, for you, you need to move your elbow out three inches to the right. You need to go up a little bit higher. Your launch angle needs to be a little bit lower. They can run simulations and then come back and immediately tell the coach for that person, their mechanics, their technique, here's what they would be best at. Now, you still have to make a choice. What am I optimizing for? Accuracy or getting my release off quicker or... Th but they can tell you and run simulations and tell you exactly mechanically where you'll have the most effectiveness. Pretty dope, right? Again, these are out now, friends. None of these are like, you know, they're out. Real, real technologies, okay? And then the digital twin is actually real. So this is a company called Spexa where you can actually go in and, and they can build digital twins of you and they can adapt and changes uh, your, your training and your programming based on exactly what's happening in your physiology. The more metrics you have, the more trackers and wearables and things that are available to you, it all syncs up to their platform and they will figure out exactly what's going on and you can get automated adaptive training based on what's happening in your response based on your goal. Um, they were actually able to do this. This is wild. They've done this on a number of different times, but they went to, um, I think it was world championships in Sweden in swimming and they handed the coach for one of the teams, a card six weeks before the race and said, this is the exact times your players are going to, or your, your swimmers are going to swim. And then they landed within under a single percent accuracy on race day. And they've done this a bunch, actually. I've seen it. It's wild. So just your training data, not even your, your labs or anything else, just your training data can tell how you're going to perform six weeks from now. Okay. Now, in doing that appropriately, this is really the current state, right? So number one is all about assessment. You have to be able to figure out like where you're currently at now. And I give this one the green light. I showed you some technologies that are coming, that are on the way. But the honest reality is like you can complain about any commercially available technology like Aura, like I kind of gave them some, but they're going to get better. I mean, you really think it's going to be more than a couple of years before Aura has an FDA approval to clinically diagnose sleep disorders? For sure they're going to. It's not perfect, but it's going to get better, right? Technology is just going to get better. So your ability to, to run assessments on anything you want is going to be here soon, if it's not already. 
2, 3, and 4 is where it gets tricky, okay? Because how do you know, how do you evaluate? All right, this goes back to the reference range. Am I good, bad, terrible? According to who? Compared to what? We don't have databases yet. We don't have an NHANES for only healthy people. We don't know where these things lie, right? And then where should I go? I call these the dead zones. Like, there's no Polaris. I don't know what the North Star is. Like, I can't really tell you an optimal blood glucose level. I just know, like, don't be here and here. I don't know if there is a such thing as an optimal blood glucose. That probably doesn't exist, right? For some things, sure, but some things probably not. And then the fourth one gets really tricky, and that is, okay, great. How do I get there? What do I take? What do I do exactly to promise you can get there? Because that is a whole nother step. I'm trying to identify getting the exact solution. How is it happening and why is it happening? Right now, that's where all of you come in. That's when you say, hey, there's no peer-reviewed data on this exact situation. But I think, in my experience, we should do this and you'll get there. That's just coaching. That's just expert opinion. That is, that is still evidence-based. That's exactly what evidence-based is supposed to mean. Best shot based on the data we have, right? And then eventually that will be the digital twin, but it's not fully here yet. So I know I'm uh, getting a little short. Hey, this is, I'm pretty close to on time. Um, so I want to kind of end with showing you a little bit of this. I opened up by saying kind of this is our process. We run these comprehensive evaluations so we can give precision and effective solutions. And so the question is, does it work or not? I always like to end on a couple of our, our case studies. We have many of these, but... Um, this is one of our pitchers. Uh, Trevor, been in the major league for like seven or eight years. You can see in red there, like he had an all right career. And then a couple of years after working with us, signed the biggest contract in major league baseball history. And that is my way of saying I take 100% credit for that. <laughs> no one else on the team, nor him or his parents get any credit. This is entirely me and my system. I hope the audio is working. The next one, uh, and he went on to win the Cy Young, by the way. The next one is a, a, a fighter, Brian Ortega. So Brian fought in, in this fight uh, for a world championship, and as you can see, it did not go well. Came to us, took us a couple of years. We, we entirely rebuilt him. Um, there's some audio playing here, but if it doesn't play, I'll show you. Um, and so we spent a couple of years. First fight back was a main event, five-rounder. We had to go to Abu Dhabi and fight on this wild thing called Fight Island. It was totally nuts. New team, new physiology, new approach, halfway across the world, time zone change, just a bunch of mess to do with. Ortega's been using a lot of science since we saw him last. Really felt like he was neglecting certain no, no, areas and being a Talk professional about all the athlete. He's using now. But he's fixed all of that. That's the thing as well. When you can get as far as Brian Ortega did on, you know, skills alone. You know, when you yeah. start adding those other facets to your game, discipline with your eating. Oh, beautiful little touch on the inside leg to stifle the attack of Korean Zombie. Very intelligent move. I love those feints that Brian's showing him, right? Showing him at the leg, showing him up top. Because right now, the Korean Zombie's having a better... Oh! We're a little short on time, so I'll cut this video. But Brian won. Brian Ortega, this what a fantastic part. performance, my man. How good does it feel? Put this whole rivalry and all this behind you with a dominant performance like you just had. It feels good, man. It feels good. But I got one message. All my, all my homies that roll with me, even after the last one, I love you. For all you who counted me out, learn to count, motherfuckers. <laughs> all right. Um, this is our... Uh... You'll see this announcement next week if you follow me at all, but uh, we have our, our performance blood work company launching on Monday. Congratulations, Andy. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thanks so much for watching this episode of The Metabolic Link with Dr. Andy Galpin. I hope you enjoyed his presentation. If you're listening to this on a podcast player, know that you can also watch it on YouTube and you can see his uh, slides. So if you wanted to check out what he's referencing, make sure you head on over to our Metabolic Health Summit YouTube channel. If you're already watching this, Thanks so much for watching. And uh, we're going to be putting out a couple of episodes a month. So certainly stay tuned. And until next time, thank you so much for watching.